Have you ever stopped and smelled the roses on Alma Dam and wonder what vital role these and other plants play in our lives? Alma Dam is located on the southernmost tip of Cape Breton. This island is both rich in history and culture, with a past that reaches back to the time of the first explorers. A short time after Columbus's first voyage across the Atlantic, French, English, and particularly Basque fishermen began using Alma Dam as a summer base for their North Atlantic fishing and whaling expeditions. The first permanent settlement on Alma Dam occurred during the French regime at Louisbourg. By the 19th century, Arishat was one of the major ports in Atlantic Canada. Many ships headed for the Canadas and merchants that engaged in trade between the Caribbean, Europe and Canada found Alma Dam ideally situated for a stopover place. By the 1860s, so many Spanish, French and American vessels were going in and out of Arishad that those countries maintained consular agents at Arishad to look after the affairs of their nations. The ships and businesses have left Alma Dam, but the plants they brought with them still remain. Due to the fact that Alma Dam is an island, and Arishat being a major shipping port, Alma Dam accumulated many plants. Plants and plant seeds were brought to Alma Dam for decoration, food, and accidentally by clothing or from other supplies on ships. Another way that plants were introduced was through the droppings of passing birds. Due to the introduction of foreign plant life on Alma Dam, interbreeding led to the creation of new plants on the island. It is very difficult to speak of just plants when there are many other factors that affect their lives. Weather, birds, insects, and many more elements make up the Earth's ecosystems. We will not be able to cover all those subjects, but they are important to keep in mind. To find out more about what is happening outside and inside plants, we spoke with Denise Forgeron from the University College of Cape Breton. Why are plants uh, so important? Well, pl plants perform the most important function to life on the earth as we know it. And this function is the process of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. And in photosynthesis, they take carbon dioxide and water, and they make glucose, which is a simple sugar, mm -hmm. and give off oxygen for the animals. Mm -hmm. In order for this to happen, we have to have light energy and you'll also have to have the chlorophyll in the chloroplasts of the cell. So how do plants reproduce? Well, there's male and female parts to a plant, and this is a model of a plant. These are uh, sepals and petals, which are modified leaves, and this would be modified leaf structures also. These are the male parts of the plants, okay. the anthers that will contain the pollen. Mm -hmm. and they can break open by various ways depending on the type of plant but if they dried and broke open and released the pollen to the air the pollen going through the air will land on the female part okay. and this contains the ovary okay. and it's called the pistil the whole thing is the pistil so it will land on the stigma and these are the pollen grains here okay. and they'll eat their way by way of enzymes through the style down to the ovary where there will be an egg waiting okay. and this can have variations also there can be many different uh, eggs waiting to be fertilized in so one particular plant or in, or in, or in different plants you see different variations every plant has a different oh, okay. its own unique um, number of sepals and petals and, and number of stamens and oh, the, okay. the organization within the pistil. Okay. And so when the, the pollen eats its way down through to the egg, it will fertilize it and there are also other cells here uh, will, that will, and other two cells will be fertilized to make an endosperm and that will be the nutrients for the developing embryo within the seed and then the seed will be formed in here. The seeds can be released by many methods, and there's many methods of dispersal. And you spoke of the, the burdock yeah. being stuck to the animals. Yeah. That's one way. Another way is with birds. 
or other animals that eat the seeds and then they'll come out through the digestive tract and the seeds from cherry trees or apple trees can be released somewhere else and other seeds might just fall to the ground and each one of these um, has stamens and ovaries and look here so these are all rays and there's also disc florets and each one of those is a single flower each one of these and each one of those little tiny ones here and you can even see the pistil sticking up here some of these some plants are not very pleasant to look at but perform an important role in the food chain as denise will explain the reason some people wouldn't swim in in an area that would have all the algae there is because if there's a lot of algae the water isn't good to drink um, but the algae is part of the basics in the bottom of the food chain and it also has chlorophyll and will produce food it doesn't have flowers but it has uh, male and female parts and it will produce okay. food and then other organisms that live in the water will eat it and then they'll start the food chain on, in the water, the same as the plants are on the land. Now, what about uh, a, f a fungi? Well, everything happens in a cycle, and you'll have all of these plants living, and then at some point they, they're going to die and be on the ground, and so the, f the bracket fungi or the, the mushrooms may grow up around it when the decaying material. So then they're making use of the nutrients and um, changing it into a different form. So then the cycle can be completed. And then the ground will, will be lush with all these nutrients and then some new plant may grow. Lichen contains an algae and a fungus and are grouped under fungi. They can inhabit harsh environments and are found in great amounts in Petit Gras and Kipuget. Lichens are the first organism to colonize newly formed volcanic islands or rock exposed by melting glaciers. Yellow lines on the sepals of the iris are guidelines for bees. Bees crawl along these lines to reach the nectar at the base of the flower. Then pollen on the bee is rubbed off on the style and additional pollen from stamens stick to the bee for transfer to another plant. There are many beautiful flowers like the iris, but this can be deceiving. For example, the iris, beautiful as it may be, can be extremely poisonous if consumed in large doses. Sheep laurel, another beautiful flower, is poisonous to livestock. The burdock undoubtedly has one of the most efficient methods of spreading its seeds. The burrs can become entangled in the hair of animals, allowing seeds to be distributed to new areas. Thalma Poria from Poriaville is a World War II veteran. Apart from his military career, Velma spent most of his years farming. What were the most used plants? But the plants. No, well, the most used plants would be in, uh, peppermint, wild peppermint, for uh, colics and stuff like that. You boiled it and drank it. Plankton for cuts. Those powdered uh, uh, dust puffs that you pick up and you squeeze. Squeeze and, the, and the dust comes out. And uh, yeah. sap off of uh, off of a uh, fir tree. Another remedy too is onions or a cold, especially a chest cold. Onions and sugar. Cut up the onion, put sugar on it, and drink the juice from it. All right. That was one, and then there was sulfur and molasses, and there was one with peppermint. Different, different flu uh, colds that you had, you know? Oh, okay. And they worked, too. Jeez. So there was no drugstore in them days. What about dandelions? Can you use for dandelions? Dandelions, well, the roots of dandelions are edible. They make a good salad. Very, very, uh, contains a lot of protein in that people that like them and they make a good they make a good wine pretty yeah. potent too is that right yeah and uh, i mean i drank lots of that drank lots of that now, didn't you? we used to have barn yarn ends the barn was over <laughs> there there just a little line from where the sawhorse is the barnyard bends they were loose eh? mother had made a bench of dandelion one and she threw the the bottom part after she drained it threw it up in the yard and the hens ate it and everyone got the drug door tried to head for the barn door standing oh. when it went on the ground like that. oh geez that's good that, that was comical that's my grandmother was saying what a sin what a sin getting the hens drunk <laughs> that's good yeah um, i remember also another story um you mentioned something about uh, gathering seaweed or something from long island in a boat 
Oh, well, that was for farming. In them days, we used to farm so much, we didn't have enough barnyard manure, so what you'd have to do is you'd get up maybe at 4 o'clock in the morning, eh, and you'd have to go all the way around through a couple of rooms where the lighthouse was to get on the Long Beach because you couldn't get there with oxen, eh? And the kelp used to come on the other side of the beach, like what they call the Grand here, and you can see there are some little white waves, and they used to bring kelp, would be that high, eh? So you'd go there and you'd have to mark your own pile. There'd be so many people picking kelp there that, you know, you'd, you'd mark your pile. And then you'd go there at night in the breeze and pick up the kelp and haul it up on the shore in the pile. And then you had to go back and take it from that side of the beach to this side of the beach. Okay. And then go with a boat and take it from the beach to the shore. And then from the shore you had to haul it in the field to plant with it. Full so day's it work. Quite, it, full day's work, well, I guess, to haul spring. What do you think we could find in, in, in uh, this field? What uh, type of plants? Well, and I know if you go up through here, you can find in this field here, you can find uh, raspberries, you can find blackberries, you can find blueberries, you can find foxberries, you can find, uh, wait now, what is, uh, sour pears, a pierrot, they call it French. It's a little, small little blackberry, they grow under the trees up there. What do you uh, think about the importance of plants today? Do you see it changed at all? or? They don't care about them, you know, they don't even notice them, you know what I mean? They, they, they see them and that's it, they're not noticed because everybody cuts their, mows their lawn now and the weeds don't grow because the lawns are cut fine, see? Sure. It's only in the fields like that that you find stuff. The dandelion is a very popular plant. Our lawns, bare as they may seem when cut, contain many plants red clover, white clover, pineapple weed, plantain, dandelion, and many more. Many people are happy to cut their dandelions in the spring, but do we acknowledge that this plant is more rich in vitamin A and C than most vegetables or fruit? Or that its roots are able to travel through tougher soil to get deep down to bring up nutrients that other plants cannot reach? The pitcher plant is a particularly interesting plant on Amadan. Its leaves are tubular shaped to hold water. Sweet substance around the rim of each of these tubes attract insects to the plant. When the insects enter the tube, they become trapped when they cannot climb the walls of the plant because of the downward pointed hairs. The insect eventually drowns in the water and the plant digests the insect by means of a fluid secreted by the glands located in the leaves. The plant obtains nitrogen from its prey because it grows in nitrogen deficient environments. Water lilies are found in Isle Madame ponds. Many small aquatic animals lay their eggs on the leaves and stems of the plant. Here we see the cow lily. Roses are found in many places all over Almadam. Along beaches, beds of roses help stabilize the sand. Rose thickets are a great shelter for many small birds. The rose hips provide food for many birds and mammals. Pheasants and robins particularly like the rose hips in the winter. They are an excellent source of vitamin C calcium, and iron. Mrs. Wilby, author of When the Doctor Couldn't Come, a book on the medicinal values of plants in Cape Breton, will explain the three most common roses on Almadan. There are three different kinds of roses that are really prevalent on Almadan, and almost everybody sees them almost every day, even though they might not be aware of it. The uh, most common type, and probably native to the island, is the what they call the wild rose or the rosa gallica, uh, which comes from Britain, actually. Uh, I, don't, I can't get that together because gallica is French. And, oh, you know. okay. <laughs> but anyway, they're five petaled roses and they grow low to the ground and they're prevalent in fields everywhere. They're usually pink in color. I haven't ever seen on Amadam any other color. Uh, the second type is the Rosa Rugosa, which was originally imported from Japan. That comes in a, a very deep, almost a magenta color, and it comes in a pink and it comes in a white. And many people use them as ornamentals on their lawn, but they grow wild uh, along the shore, and uh, their, uh, their medicinal proper properties are similar to the uh, wild rose. Then there's the hawthorn tree, which doesn't look like a rose at all, sure. right? But it has small white flowers uh, in late spring, which develop into red berries in the fall, and that they're uh, used as vitamin C in uh, tonics. Uh, in one of the world wars, and I'm not sure which one it was, but I think it might have been World War II, they made uh, jellies of these hawthorn berries. 
is there any plant on Ilma Dam that has a particularly an, in, an interesting history? And then that could be in any way. An interesting history. I would say the Japanese imports are the, are the most fascinating to me. They had to come in by ship, and uh, they've been here. Uh, I've, the, the, the patch of uh, Japanese knotweed uh, that's in, our, in the higher field uh, has been here at least 75 years that we know about, and so it's probably here for many more. And also the tiger lilies, the, and uh, also the Rosa rugosa, which, one you mentioned. which right, which came from Japan originally, and I think that the history of their coming, uh, definitely by ship, uh, would be fascinating to research. How did they come here? Did they come, did they make a stop along the way where they brought in as ornamentals, or did some captain just think they were pretty and and brought them in, and now they're noxious weeds? You know, how did sure. that happen? That's true. That's true. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, a lot of the grasses that grow here are native, such as the sedge grass and such as the, uh, I think some of the fescue might be native, but a lot of the grasses here are, uh, uh, were uh, planted, were imported, the seed was imported to feed animals. It's the tall timothy uh, was imported, the shorter timothy is, uh, uh, is a hybrid, it, it crossed with other grasses. and. Uh, they, they are probably imported. Many, many plants on Amadam were imported. In the woods, of course, the various mushrooms, edible mushrooms, and the barks, and the needles, such as spruce needles, they were native here, and uh, the uh, Micmacs certainly shared their medical knowledge with the settlers from the very beginning. That co goes from the Portuguese who came in the summer, and also the uh, later on the French from uh, from Louisbourg after the defeat of Louisbourg, uh, the uh, Scott from the Highland. He brought many of the oats and and uh, things from his native yeah. country. Yeah, they come from all over. All over the place. <laughs> yes, dandelion is a wonderful flower. It uh, its pro its properties are are just vast. I'll name a few. It's used to break up hard clay soil. Uh, wherever you see dandelions, you can know that your soil is much too compacted. Uh, it's uh, you can use every part of it to f as, as nutrition. Uh, the roots and the young leaves in the springtime just about universally are boiled up. The, the, the greens are four greens and the roots um, you just eat, you know, boiled up, and uh, you can flavor them with uh, scraps of pork or ham or whatever, and uh, a little vinegar and sugar or sugar substitute, and it makes like a sweet and sour effect, and they're they're out of this world. If you want earthworms for fishing, look for the dandelions. There are always earthworms in the roots of dandelions, and you'll always find your worms, no matter how dry it is. The dulse I told you about, that's harvested, dried, and sold here, and it's very nutritional. Can be sprinkled on salads and incorporated in salads are used as, um, you know, an adju adjunct to fish. It depends on how many times you rinse it or how, how, how you like it. People who like salty things would really like it. How important do you think it is for, for kids uh, in Ilma Dam to know more about plants? I think environmental awareness is absolutely essential to every child, not only in Ilma Dam, but everywhere in Canada. And I think the importance of it would be is once they understand an ecological system, they can interpret what's going on when any phenomenon occurs, such as devastation by the hemlock looper or the gypsy moth or any other invading insect or uh, animal or weather conditions. Uh, I think it should be part of integrated science from the time they're in grade primary. Like a five or six year old can stay at a pond's edge or lake's edge forever and look at all the different flora and fauna there and study them. They might not know the names for them, right? But they know what they are. Sure. And, and the thing is they yeah. to make that, let that continue. Exactly. Somehow. Because as you become older, you say, oh yeah, I remember seeing that water skipper when I was, you know, yeah. out with my dad or whatever at age five. And uh, then in biology, you study this insect. Well, there you are. Cattails are found in marshes, ditches, and in the shallows of lakes, ponds, and slow streams. They provide a home for many types of animals, in particular the muskrat and the red-winged blackbird. All parts of the cattail can be used. Introduced from Europe, red clover is a common plant here on Almadan. Seeds and leaves are eaten by many birds and mammals. The clover produces nitrogen and enriches the soil. What comes to mind when the word weed is mentioned? Most people jump to conclusions and think of weeds as troublesome. 
Few people look at the benefits they can offer and do offer. They provide a way for the roots of other plants to gain a more extensive feeding zone. They bring nutrients back to the surface soil. Many weeds are rich in nutrients and when they die and decompose, they enrich the soil. They can be used in a controlled way to help crops and even keep your garden free from other weeds. Using certain weeds to help enrich your soil will discourage the worst weeds. This is because most weeds prefer poor ground. Despite the many arguments about whether weeds are beneficial or not, all weeds are interesting in some aspect. On Isle Madame, there are many different types of trees, all of which are important in maintaining biodiversity on this small island. It is very obvious that Denique Terrio Verisat loves the outdoors. Denique will now share with us her culinary and other uses of plants. These are cattails and a lot of people, the thing is a lot of people don't realize that they're not just nice to look at, that you can really eat. Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. can eat this. Like, I mean, for many years it was used for eating. I'll show you, like the roots are really good. You can haul the whole thing up and you can dry it and you can pound it and mortar it down. It makes a really good flour. So it was always used, yeah, it was really good flour, totally organic. And at this time of the year, which is around like the early part of the summer and spring, like you can also eat, you can also eat this part of it right here. I'll show you. There's a piece in here. Yeah, I have to get it apart for you. Like what you have in here, you actually have like an ear of corn. You see, you actually have like an ear of corn. You see it right in there? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what you do with this, it's like when it's young like this, because after this is like the, the older stage, okay. and what you do is you can just take this part right apart, right here, and you have the inside here, and you boil this just like corn on the cob. You know, it's really good with it, like you can make a really nice lemon and herd butter, for example. You take like four tablespoons of butter, add some fresh chopped parsley to it, maybe a clove of garlic, you crunch that up, a bit of like lemon salt or something like that, and you boil this up and you saute it up with that type of butter. It's excellent. It's a really good meal. So this is a dandelion, all right? Now, if you want to use these as a vegetables, what you would do is you would take the whole plant and you would boil it. Okay, in some salted root, water, the whole, the whole plant, okay. the whole plant, Roots okay, and right, and like you, and what you do is the juice that's left over, you can use that as a tonic, all right, so what you boil it in, you save that water, and then you can drink it later, and it's an excellent tonic, like it really cleans out your system, okay, so you're not wasting anything, sure. the water that you boil it in, you save that, and you put that in the fridge, and you drink it throughout the next week, and it's excellent, really gives your body a good cleanup. So what you do is you boil this, and the way we make it at home, it's like Swiss char, or like spinach, we boil it, we take a fresh onion, a whole onion, we dice it up in little pieces, we take like some unsalted or salted butter, right, you add your onion, add a little bit of garlic to it, same thing, and you toss it up with that, and you serve it like that, and usually we put a little bit of fresh lemon on top of it as well, and it's nice. And you can use different sauces. You can put a cheese sauce over it, you know, if you want to make a cheese sauce, or you can even use like a bechamel, which is the same thing, your onion, a white sauce, you know, with some chicken sauce, and some chicken stock, and you just thicken it up with some flour, but these are excellent. Okay, now this here, this is plantain, and this was like really one of the staples in my family anyway. Like I use it all year round, you know, because even in, you know, even in the winter, this stuff is pretty hardy stuff. So what you have is like, you, you can use the whole plant, the leaf, and you have the seeds here which grow up on a stalk, and I'll give you some of the ideas, some of the things I use it for. Now when the, the leaves are really young, we use it as a vegetable. Okay, we boil it up, and I usually saute it. I usually serve it like with sauteed bacon bits and, and onions, you know, and uh, I'll even sometimes put, like, use it in, in, um, in lasagna, you know, between layers of lasagna, and I, I chop it up, I boil it up, and I use it in lasagna, like with the cottage cheese and, oh, and the tomato. It's excellent, you know, and, and yeah, and feta and stuff like that. And, what, and a good way to use it, too, is like I, one of the primary um, things I use it for is for a soup. We make a really nice plantain soup. And the interesting thing, these plants are also, this leaf can also be used used as a poultice, which means you can take this plant if you're somewhere out in nature and you get burned or you get stung, okay, or you have highs, it's really good for that. You just take off the leaf and you crush it up in your hand, for example, you would take it like this and you would just crush it, like instantly. Okay. You, can soak the, you can soak the leaves a little bit, then you would apply it, for example, you know, directly, directly to wherever you had your there. burn and hold it there. You know, you could use a bigger leaf, like a burdock leaf, if it was something really serious you wanted to wrap it up. We have burdock that grows here with the great big leaves, leaves you know, right. and you could wrap that around you, you too. Place it over the cutter yeah. or the burn or something. Yeah, but this is an interesting plant because you use almost every part of it. Like what I do for the summertime too, like the winter time, I'll pick this in the summer and uh, I'll tie these plants, I'll tie all these together 
you know what I mean? And then okay. I'll hang them over the wild birds nice. in the um, in the winter time. Yeah. Like I'll put like a whole bunch of them together, you know, maybe 15, 20, okay. and they dry in my back porch on the racks. And then I hang them out in winter, and all the birds come birds. and eat them. Sparrows, everything that's around will come and eat them. And on, again, this has another multi-purpose use. If you take these seeds right off here and you boil them, you pour boiling hot water on top of them, you'll get like this white, this white foam that'll come off them. And that's really good. If you cool that, you just skim that off and you can use it as a hair gel. Like it will hold your hair right in place. Okay. You know, so you just skim it off and you let it cool. And then if you want like an organic type of a hair gel, hair gel. that's what you can use it for. Jeez, that's good. Yeah, so there's uh, lots of different purposes for it. And like I said, you know, you can also use it as salad when it's the leaves are really, really young. There are some over there, they're quite different when they're young, like they're, um, there you go. You know, there's some right there that's much young. That would be very tender. You know, like I use this size for soup, you know, because it's quite a bit, you know, it's, it gets a little tougher as it grows. And now we're moving on to like a different area, like we were at a marsh and then we went to the beach and then you have like the a diff different ecosystem here like you've got the rocks here and it's very bare and you have lichen growing here you know yeah. so right here like just for example like here's your fox berries okay same thing leaves are good for tea now these berries are really good for jams jellies um they were used uh, quite a bit too you can also pound them out like with beef jerky or you can make your own beef jerky like just make it in the stove and dry your meat you know and you can uh, make a form of pemmican with this and just crush the berries you know just crush them all flat and just mix it in with your, your beef jerky and it makes like little pads like it's really good if you go hiking and stuff like that and it keeps forever and they're really good for jams and jellies good for pies you know all kinds of different the leaves things look kind of thick looking I don't know yeah that's right and they're very very distinctive little leaves and it's very short to the ground and grows in areas like this you know what i mean where there's a lot of rock a lot of sunshine it doesn't need a lot of ground to grow oh. and right here like we have juniper and this here too, this is really good for making wreaths as well too, it takes a while. But here you have the juniper berry and like I use this extensively um, right now it's in its early stages and it's green but it'll become a dark purplish blue color, a very dark color. Okay. And we usually pick these, myself and the children, and we'll dry them. And what I'll do is I'll use them whole in sauerkrauts in bowls dinner and it gives a really nice like a, a sprucey flavor. Like a spruce, it's, it's delicious, like a, a strong pepper okay. flavor. It's really, really good. And these get bigger? Do they get, yeah. Okay. They get about, this is about the standard size you're going to get them, but now they're going to ripen, and that's when they go into the, the dark, purplish Perfect. black right. color. Okay. okay. You know, but these are a really good spice. And uh, speaking of spices, like you turn right around here, and you've got your bayberry here. Now, just, now just take a whiff of that. Just smell that. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. Okay. It's one of the most aromatic yeah. um, wild herbs you, you can get. Use. It grows everywhere. The side grows everywhere I've ever seen in Cape Breton and Nova Scotia. It's a short bush like this. And you can tell, and what I do is I usually pick entire branches or I'll pick a bush and I hang it up upside down and I dry it for the winter. It's like a wild bay leaf. Excellent with chicken, excellent good. for spicing fish. You know, it's especially good fresh. I mean, you don't need more than one or two to do the leaves job. <laughs> to do the job easy because it's so yeah. aromatic. And so you can use the whole plant too. You dry it and right here. You can just see the berries that are starting to, uh, the berries are just starting to grow now. By the fall, yeah. there'll be a large waxy looking berry, like a grayish type berry. Yeah. And they use them for making uh, bayberry candles. You know, like you just put your wax, you put your berry in with it, and you get that really nice, it has a really nice aroma, like a very sprucey, piney so type candles, of aroma. Candles, yeah, so. so they use those extensively for those. But I also picked this, and I dry. It looks just like pepper. It looks just like the black pepper that you buy in the store to put in the ground pepper. And I'll dry it, and I use it as a ground, a ground pepper as well. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, this is just like, this is an incredibly smell, versatile though. bush. I think the smell oh, is Oh, and it's so good with chicken, so good with fish. It's yeah. good with roast, it's good with lamb, it's good with anything, Universal. you know? Universal. Yeah, and see, right here, even when you're you're stepping right here, you've got the wild blueberries. You know, like everywhere you walk, there's something you can eat. This is the way it works, you know what I mean? It's just Watch amazing. Where you're stepping. Yeah, and of course, the blueberries, everybody's familiar with blueberries too, but the tea, or, you can also make a tea with the leaves, like for a, a tonic. The blueberry you know? leaves. Yeah, you just uh, steep it and uh, you make a decoction. You just like drain it off and you can just keep that in the fridge and use it as a tonic if you like you know it's just incredible there's just like so many things around Each one of our guests was asked the question, what would you tell the people of Isle Madame about the importance of plants on their island? 
Well, first I think I'd like to tell them that they're very fortunate to live in such oh, a great environment filled with yeah. so much variety of plants. Where I'm from the city, there, there's often grass yards and maybe a shrub that's planted as an ornamental that they got at a nursery. And you have so many native species and, and even ornamentals that I believe some of the French settlers brought here. Um, there's a great biodiversity here. There's in the order of tens of thousands of plants. And you would have so many untouched plants that, that were brought in here. And also, you would have plants, you're close enough to the mainland that you would also have plants that Come would have made its way by birds and, okay. and um, vehicles. Okay. Yeah, it's a neat environment. Well, what I tell them, well, I would I say I would try to I tell them to try to identify them and, and, and uh, you know, try and get them uh, to, uh, even if they had to transplant them, try to get them to grow in an environment where you could easily collect them and see them, you know, because they are beautiful. You know, there's such an interest in plants now that there wasn't before that uh, something should be done about it. Somebody could write up, get the full history and write about them, get people interested in them. Okay, I'll start by saying I couldn't tell them anything. They've told me more than I could ever know. But uh, of the importance of plants here, I would say maintain the ecological balance here. When uh, when forests are managed, make sure buffers, adequate buffers are left around lakes. Uh, make sure uh, that with the native plants you preserve them and don't kill them. And make sure you think twice before naming noxious weeds or noxious plants uh, because they do have uses and value. And uh, generally, I would say that Almadam does very well in all those areas. I mean, they don't, there, there's not too much spraying done here except very locally and well advertised. And uh, they do use organics whenever possible. But to really be involved and know what's happening in, in the environment. Well, I think what I'd like to say is that there's an incredible wealth on this island that uh, I think sometimes we take for granted and sometimes we don't quite see it as well as we should. And with all the plants and mushrooms and all the things that are available here, like it's a multi-purpose type of benefits that you would get from it. You've got the practical sense, like it can really help your food bill. And you know, then you've got the, the physical sense where you're out there in the wild and getting the exercise and like you're reading you're getting back to nature type of thing and then of course like you're out there and you have like you know the spiritual side where you've got a lot of time to think I mean and what more could you want for stress release and tension it's like a self therapy you know and um, then you have all the practical benefits as well you know the essential like the quality of it you know the natural side of it you know the top quality foods that you can get with all these natural elements that would be really really beneficial to you and I think um, the point I would make is that there's a real simple way of getting yourself really back to reality, you know, and also benefit from it in many other ways, you know, like practical, economical, financial, and physical. If you just find time but to maybe smell the roses, I think, you know. Humility is necessary if we are to understand how to work with nature. If we don't learn how to work with nature, we will harm nature's ecosystems and our own ability to survive economically and environmentally. Today we call this sustainable development. One of the reasons people continue to destroy plant life is because of the lack of knowledge of what they are destroying. It's unlikely we will ever know all there is to know about plants. This is what makes the learning of nature so interesting. Mm -hmm.